Hi, I'm Ann Gunther, and today we're going to be uh, painting a mountain scene with evergreens and sort of some blue purple mountains in the background and a brook. So with rocks, so as I go through, I'm going to tell you, as I go through the directions, I'm gonna tell you what uh, paints I use, what brushes I use, why I'm doing what I'm doing. Um, this is a pretty simple little scene, but the way the method I teach is I try to go step by step so that it's easy easy to understand and I also try to explain why I'm doing what I'm doing, why I'm using the colors I'm using, and why I draw things the way I do. So how I'm going to start out is I'm going to actually draw this out for you in a pencil so you can see the basic shapes that I'm thinking of um, as I draw it out and then we'll go right into the watercolor and I will tell you about my watercolors as I use them as well. So this is the... Um, scene that we will be doing today. I actually took it from a card and I get a lot of my ideas from photographs, cards, um, just all over calendars, a lot of things. Some of them are already drawn or painted out. Some of them are photographs, uh, but today I decided it'd be a little bit easier if we already reproduce something that was in a painting form and this looks like it's watercolor so it should be pretty easy to uh, reproduce. So I'm going to start out with um, drawing this out and I find I've, I've masked out my paper and I am using to let you know I'm using Arches watercolor paper. It's 140 pound and it is a cold press paper. Um, I'm not going to take time to explain everything in such detail because we are on a limited time here today, but I do teach classes. And so if you are interested in what I'm doing, you can find out more about it in the classes that I teach. So today I'm going to start out and I find the horizon line, which is the line basically between where the sky meets the back part of the land. And in this painting, uh, it's about a third of the way down the page. It's about right here, okay? As the brook, I'm not gonna draw all these little rocks around the brook, but what I am gonna do is I'm gonna find the ba basic angles of the brook, and I'm also gonna determine how far up the page it goes. So it's about, if I do my horizon line here, and the brook turns right about here, if I divide my page in thirds, it's about a third where it starts to turn, comes down here. And I'm drawing fairly lightly. A 2H pencil would be probably good to draw it out in because it's not such a dark pencil. You don't want really, really dark lead because then that, when you put add water to the page, that puts a, that, excuse me, that um, will make your watercolor dirty. So I'm just drawing the basic shape of the brook without the rocks right now. And let's see, I'm looking at some of the angles of where the colors change in the picture. So let's see, there's a little bit like this. There's a little change there. We've got a green hill that heads up this way. There's a little bit of division here and I'm going to just outline the edges of the trees just so I know about how tall I want them. And I'm noticing this tree right here is below the mountain line. It comes below, it's not above, okay? But then when I get to these trees over here, they extend above that back mountain line. So this is about where those back mountains are gonna be. I'll just add those in right now as I'm thinking about it. So I'm gonna keep this little tree down lower and then these extend up. I'm also keeping in mind how far over is this tree from the edge of the page? It's a little over to the left of the halfway point of the page. So lightly, I'm going to sketch these trees out and I will probably go ahead and add more detail to them when I do the actual painting but I don't have to put a lot of detail. Do not spend a lot of time drawing. That's not what this is about right now. I teach drawing classes and you can take those later on, but right now we wanna keep this as simple as possible. So right there is uh, the basic drawing that I have. And now I think I'm going to add a few of the rocks in here, not all of them yet, because I will be doing them. I will 
add some more in the watercolor itself and I don't wanna take my entire time to sketch out the rocks. But if you notice in the foreground, which means at the bottom of the page or as the viewer is looking into this scene, the rocks are bigger in the foreground. As they move back into the distance, they appear to be getting smaller. And that's how we draw perspective when we're drawing things out. So I'm gonna start sketching some of these rocks out. And one thing I wanna tell you guys is when you're doing rocks, don't do them like this. They're sitting on a ground. So they're level with the ground. So they're gonna be flat pretty much because they're in this layer of ground and then they come up out of the ground basically like that. So as we move back, they're gonna get smaller. Some of them are overlapping. Just, I might leave a little space in between some. Some of them come out into this field over here and they get pretty tiny back here. Now I've got some big boulders up in here. And again, they're overlapping. So I'm gonna have some of these overlapping. And I see a few little rocks sprinkled in the brook. They're coming out into the water. Their little tops are showing. So I'm gonna indicate a few of those in here. Don't make them all the same size. That's gonna be boring. So you want your rocks in the front to be bigger. And as they go and move towards the back of the picture plane, they get smaller. There's some little flowers or something going on in here, but I'm not gonna do that right now. So, all right, we're gonna start on our watercolor. And when I do watercolor, I start from the back and I move forward. So that means I'm gonna start with the sky and do a wash. Then I'm going to put the uh, mountains in, muted mountains in purples and blues because things in the distance appear to be cooler. So blue and purple is uh, a little cooler in color than a red or an orange. Then we move forward. We're gonna, get, we're gonna lay in our greens. We're gonna lay in the brook. And then the darkest thing, which is these trees, is what I'm gonna put in probably at the end, but I'm, I may change that up a little bit as I'm doing it. I wanna talk to y'all slightly about um, colors that I use and also the type of watercolor I use. Now you can buy watercolors in um, already preset in a pan at Michael's or Hobby Lobby or um, you can even order them online. There's several art stores online. But I buy mine in tubes and then I squeeze them out into these little trays. I have a lot of different trays and depending on the make of the watercolor I use, like I'll have all of my uh, Winsor Newton watercolors in one tray. I have some called Daniel Smith. I put those in another set. Then I have others that are called um, Memare Blue and that is still in another tray. And the best thing to get is a mixing tray or a, a tray, a palette tray that has these little compartments on the side or like this, but that you also have a mixing, a large mixing area with it, okay? Which is where we're gonna mix our colors. So some of the colors I use and the basic colors I use, the basic brand is Winsor & Newton Professional Watercolors. They look like this. Um, they come in little tubes. You don't need to get a big old tube. You can get the two ounce size. Um, and you can get those actually right at Hobby Lobby or Michael's or Joann's in town. You can also, again, order them online. Uh, going this route, they're a little more expensive than if you get something at one of the craft stores that are already uh, like the pan watercolors that are made for kids whatever, to do little class exercises in. These are a little more expensive, but one thing I wanna stress is you get what you pay for. So th the more um, thought and I wanna say money that you put into something, especially in art and the, the materials you use, probably the better results you're gonna get, okay? So if you are using cheap watercolor or watercolor paper, um, it may not be you. It may be the supplies you're using. So I would just say try to go for the best 
brand possible that you can afford at the time. And that goes also with brushes, and I'm gonna talk about those too. But here's a couple other little, this is Daniel Smith watercolor. This is Mamari Blue. These are all uh, common names in the watercolor industry. This is a Holbein color. They're all great watercolors. These are a little more expensive. If you're gonna go with professional, I would go with the Windsor and Newton professional and not the student grade either, but the professional. Okay, we're gonna talk real quick about brushes and then we're gonna get started. So brushes, I use synthetic brushes. Um, the best watercolor brushes there are are sable brushes, and that is real animal hair. Um, I do not use sable hair uh, for various reasons, but nowadays they make great synthetic brushes that act um, and perform as well as the sable brushes used to. You can get them in all different sizes. There's all different brands. Um, a very good economical brand to get is Simply Simmons. And let me see if I've got, they come in white handles like this. And you can get them again at a craft store, local craft store. They run about $3.99. And, and up for a brush. You can get them in all different sizes in rounds. This is a round, okay? Um, and that's basically what you're gonna use in watercolor. There's something called a flat, which is a hard flat edge like this. It's a squared off edge, that's called flat. And you will use those as well, but we're basically to lay in washes, we're gonna use the round brushes, which make a little shape like this, okay? So Simply Simmons is a great economical brand. I have a lot of other brushes. Again, I'm not gonna take the time to go into that, but um, I describe that more in the classes that I give. Um, so um, one thing I wanted to show you all, this was, I had the kids do this this summer, and this was about as basic as they got, and this is where we're gonna start. Yours should look like this, and then we're gonna go in and add more details on it, okay? But this is where we're headed, just so you get an idea, and I'm gonna teach you how to lay in everything. Okay, so we're gonna start with the back wash, the background wash. I've got clean water. I'm gonna dip my brush. I'm using one of my larger brushes. This is probably this is a size 10 brush. Also, you'll notice the sizes run differently depending on what brand you buy. Okay, so if I say a size 10 brush, not all size 10 brushes may look the same. What I'm gonna do right now is I'm going to just lay in a clear wash in the background. And actually, I'm gonna go for a little bit bigger brush to lay in my clear wash. Here's a Simply Simmons brush. This is a size 14. And I'm, I wanna just lay in a nice, loose wash. You can't even see it, of clear water, okay? It's fine if you go over the area where you're putting your trees, because when you're doing watercolor, we work from light to dark. And why do we do that? Because it's harder to take up dark things. Dark goes over light, but it's hard to get light over dark in watercolor. Okay, so I just laid a clear wash in the background where my sky is gonna be. I'm actually gonna take this size 14 brush just because I wanna get a nice mixture, a nice mix loose mix, quite a bit of water on my mixing tray. And now I'm going to go for a color, a blue. I'm gonna start out with French ultramarine blue. I'm gonna mix that in my mixing tray. I'm keeping my brush nice and, and watery. And as I dip it into my um, color, I'm keeping that quite a bit of water on that color and then bringing it over into this nice loose wash I have over here. Okay, so we're going to keep the background pretty simple, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to start, this sky is very pale, so I'm going to just stroke in very simply, lay down a fairly flat wash in here. And if you get to the point where you're scrubbing and the water is not flowing, you need to add more water to your puddle, okay? Um, this is, we're working very loose and very washy. You can see how flat that is, and it, I can get it that flat, laid in, nice, no scrubby look, because I put the clear water on first, then I went back with a nice blue wash and added this over it, okay? No, we're not gonna do any clouds today, that's for another day, another 
Another lesson. We're gonna keep this simple and we're gonna we're gonna add more detail in the front. Okay, now I'm going to start adding my mountains in the background. It's a little bit hard to see on this, this uh, painting here, but the mountains are purple and then they go into kind of a purpley blue. And then there's a little bit of foliage down um, as it hits the green of the hill. There's a little bit of green foliage, but they've added a lot of purple to that to push that green foliage way in the background to just, we're, we're saying that that's muted. That's how our eye perceives it when we look at it in the distance in real life. So I'm gonna pick up a nice, let's see, Windsor Violet. I love Windsor Violet. It's made by Windsor Newton, but I gotta find my Windsor Violet. And I'm gonna bring it over here. So this will be my main mixing tray that I'm working on just to keep things a little easier. So what did I do? I dip my brush in water, bring it over to my Windsor Violet, tap it on, the, on my squeezed out tube of, of paint over here of purple, bring it over here, make sure it's got a lot of water in it. And I'm going to just add a little bit of purple along this background. Now, one thing I wanna do is tell you, because this sky is still wet and now I'm adding this wet on top of here, the purple's starting to spread into the blue. I don't really want that to happen. So we're gonna take a little break and I'm gonna dry this real quickly. Is that okay? Oh, yeah, it's great. Um, just because that camera's there for your left arm, maybe to stay. Am back. I doing this? Am I putting just a my. a little bit. I just don't want it to get to the point where you paint lower on the canvas and I lose it. Well, I can, and I can move this up too. No, but this, it's looking great. Okay. So, Tanner, I'll give you a cue, okay? Right. I'm taking a sip of water. I'm gonna forget and put my elbow up there. Okay, all right, we just dry, dried this section and I, I have switched to a smaller brush. It's a size six brush and what is this? A Grumbacher. Not that it makes any difference, but just telling you what I'm using. So now I'm gonna dip my size six brush back in that purple wash, and I'm adding a little more color to my wash here. Okay, now I'm gonna, now because I dried this section, now I can get a really nice, I can keep that nice edge along here. It's not spreading up into the blue because I dried it before I'm putting this on. So now I've got, might have been a little wet there, so it's spreading, but I'm, I'm pretty happy with that. Also, this is not a screaming purple, right? It's, it's, I've kept it muted. And how do I do that? I add more water to it. If I wanted to really add brilliance to it, I could add a lot more of the purple paint to it. Um, medium and add it into this uh, solution of water, but we're keeping it nice and soft. Okay, now as I move forward, I'm gonna take this purple, but I'm also gonna start adding a little blue to that. So I just picked this French ultramarine blue up and I moved it over and now I'm making sort of a purpley blue color. Little patch and see, still got quite a bit of water in it. So let's see, little blue. I'm gonna get a little more blue in there. So if you put it down and you say, well, I still want a little more color, that's fine. You can add a little more blue in it. So now, as it moves forward, oops, you know what I, as it moves forward, it's gonna to start to get a little bluer, a little more purple color in it. Okay. 
Okay. So now I've got a purple back here and now I've got sort of a blue purple. Now I'm using this same solution and I'm going to add a little green to it. And what I'm adding to it, it's called Viridian. And Viridian is a blue green color. I should probably show you guys this on its own. So this is, let me just show you. This is Viridian. That's the actual color that Viridian is. Okay. So I'm going to take that and I'm going to add that to this solution that I already made on my mixing trays of blues and purples. So now I've got a green color, a blue green color, but it's got purple and blue in it as well. That's gonna give us the idea that there's some, some foliage back here, but it's still muted. And it's in the background. So let's see, I could get probably a little more, a little stronger green Viridian in there. And as it goes up this hill, it sort of just goes out into a little line here. Okay, I'm pretty happy with that. All right, now what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna let this section dry. I am actually, I think I'm gonna skip down to the brook and I'm gonna start working with just some blues. Um, I'm going to take my bigger brush and a lot of times I encourage my students to use a big brush uh, just as they're laying washes in, just so they don't get scrubby and they don't get too, too noodly is a word I like to use with um, their washes that they're layering in. I don't want you to get too complicated with details at this part. We always can add details at the end. So the way I teach, and that goes across the board in everything I do with pastel, with watercolor, with oil, with acrylic, anything, is we work from large to small. We work from big washes or big overall shapes to smaller detailed shapes. All right, so what I'm gonna do is if I notice this, this in this, picture here, there's a light area, which that is the reflection of the sky. So it's reflecting the light sky. Then there's some darker blues and then some grays around it. So what I want to do first is I'm going to get a very, again, I'm using that French ultramarine blue. I'm going to get a really, really pale French ultramarine puddle going on here. So how do I do that? I add more water to it. All right, let's see if I like that. That could even be a little too dark right there, but things always dry lighter as well on paper. So just let's put in a really flat, nice wash. If you all notice, I'm not using the tip of this brush and I'm not doing this. I am using the side of my brush and I've got quite a bit of water on there and I'm pushing it around like this, sort of like a mop. Okay, I'm not gonna go over the rocks because I do want the white of the rocks to come through. We're gonna make those gray. <gasps> okay, I've got a nice, nice, flat, light blue wash on here. What's gonna happen is as I start to build up the colors here and put darker blues, this paper that I have now, this light blue is almost gonna appear white, okay? I certainly don't want this blue any darker than what I have the sky because it's, reflect, it's a reflection of the sky, the lightest area, okay? So now it can still be wet, a little wet. I'm gonna start adding, I'm gonna pick up a little more blue in my brush and along the back here, I'm gonna add a little more blue and I'm gonna do this kind of zigzag along the side zigzag. And I'm now I'm going up on my tip because I wanna make this sort of look like ripples in the water. And I'm fine with it being darker back here. And it, it can be a little, you know, it can be a little darker in areas, a little lighter. But I'm gonna tell you right now, my biggest motto when I teach classes is less is more. If you're having fun doing something, don't do it, keep doing it and keep doing it because then you'll overwork your page, okay? 
So let's see, I'm starting to get kind of a nice little ripple effect in there. I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a little Payne's Gray and add that into my blue. Now, if you guys notice, I'm pretty careful about how much color I'm adding. I'm not picking up a huge amount of, of color with my brush and starting out dark. I'm actually right now working pretty light. And by how you do that is you just keep adding water to your solution, okay? So mm, that's getting darker, but how can I make that lighter? I can push this over to the side and I can add a little more water into it. All right, so let's see. I'm gonna add a few more ripples in here. Ooh, it's getting some nice, ooh, it's picking up and getting some nice darker edges along the side. I can bring some out, but I wanna leave that light area in the middle just to suggest that that's getting the sky along there. Generally, also, as you come closer, you're gonna tend to be, things are gonna appear darker. So I am gonna go ahead and Add a little dark up in here. Okay, I think we'll leave it like that for now. All right, let's go ahead. We're gonna start putting in, laying in some of the greens. What I'm gonna do is I am going to clean my palette out and I'm gonna start mixing some greens for you guys. So I use permanent sap green. I use hooker's green. I'll probably be using a little bit of Payne's gray, which is absolutely my favorite color because you can mix that with anything and it sort of grays colors down, but it doesn't, I never use black on anything. That dulls colors too much. So try not to ever use black and try not to use white either unless you have to, okay? The whole idea between behind watercolor is you wanna let the actual white of the paper come through or shine through in areas if you can, or at least work with the light paleness of some of the areas of watercolor to, you just don't want heavy effects going on. All right, so I'm gonna mix some greens up. I'm gonna, hmm, let's see, here's my permanent sap green. So this is what permanent sap green, I'll, I'll do a little stroke on a clean page for you. It's just a nice kind of medium green, okay? And we had our Viridian there, which you can tell there's more blue in that, right? So we're gonna start out with permanent sap green. I'm gonna mix a big kind of puddle of that. Then I'm gonna take some of that and bring it over to the side. And I think what I'm gonna do is mix a little cad yellow into this new color. Oh, look, I'm getting a nice lime, sort of lime spring green yellow over here. Then I'm gonna take my permanent sap green and bring another puddle over here. I, I'm making a new puddle of just permanent sap green. And I'm gonna take my Payne's Gray, but just a little Payne's Gray, cause it's dark and it's very, adding a dark color to this can easily overpower the color. So see how that gets a little darker? So that's what we're doing. Okay. Um, hmm. You know what, I also see, I'm gonna take Viridian because I see there's a lot of blue green still in that. So I'm gonna add a little puddle of Viridian here. And just for the heck of it, I don't know what I'm gonna use. I just kind of make puddles up and decide what colors I like. And, but I'm gonna mix Viridian and a little permanent sap green. So actually the thing that's the common denominator between all these greens is my permanent sap green because I added that to all the other colors I mixed in with it. So I'm gonna start with my lightest color, which is the spring green. And if I look at the original painting, I can see there's some light green over here. Again, I'm using sort of the edge of my brush and I'm using my big brush and if I have to get into a little corner, then I'm going up on the tip like this. What I don't want you to do is grip your brush tightly like this and, and be really tight with it. I, better you hold your brush back and be loose with it. I'm telling you, it'll work out. It works out better every time you do this, rather than if you're nervous and you hold it tight, okay? And just kind of swish that color around. Okay, ooh, I see a little green over here. Hmm. I'll throw a little green in over here because I can always go back over that. Hmm. Okay, now let's see. I think I'm gonna go with my permanent sap green. So we used our yellow green puddle. Now I'm gonna go with just the permanent sap green 
And it's okay if it runs into what you just did. I'm going to add a little bit over now on top of here. And I'm not doing my, my background, my picture, exactly like what's in the painting. It's, this is just giving me an idea, a feel for what I want to do. Um, I just dipped my brush in the Viridian. And I'm going to, let's see, I'll put a little Viridian over here. Maybe add a little Viridian over here. And I know I said that when you add blue to something, it cools it down and makes it look like it's in the distance, but there are some exceptions to the rule and it's okay if you use a little blue green up here. Let's see, I think what I'm gonna do is take this blue green Viridian and really make it pale and add a lot of water to it and add that back in here. And I have a, I also, one thing I forgot to tell you all is I have a paper towel in my hand at all times because I'm constantly dabbing my brush in the paper towel so that I don't get sopping wet, like I'm not out of control and get it everywhere, okay? Because it helps to just be able to dab it a little bit. Okay, hmm, let's see. So I'm gonna go ahead now and actually, I'm gonna go ahead and put some permanent sap green in here. And then we're gonna start adding some other layers of green over it. Once the watercolor dries, you can add the same, um, what do I wanna say, value or same uh, density of water color that you just did for the original uh, layers and it'll get darker as it so as your painting dries if you add the same watercolor over it and you go on top it'll start getting darker so i have a nice kind of light loose green very pale washy um under painting right now right so i'm gonna let this dry a little bit oh i think i'm gonna go in and start working on while it's drying the dark green of the fir trees so now what I'm gonna do is I love my Payne's Gray. I'm taking my Payne's Gray and I'm gonna add it to the darkest solution of green that I made, which was permanent sap green with a little Payne's Gray. I'm gonna add a lot more Payne's Gray into it. But I'm not gonna paint it on. This is not acrylic painting. We are not painting this opaquely. We are painting it with a very thin wash. So I can still see, now I'm starting to lay this in. Yes, it's dark, but it's, I also see the white of the paper coming through. And that's what I want you guys to aim for. I don't want it so thick that you, um, it looks like an acrylic painting. So I'm using the tip Look at this, I'm still using my size 14 brush. I just love it because if it's got a nice point on the end of it, which a better brush will have come to a nice point, um, then you can use that to do a lot of different things. So as I go to the top, I'm using the point a little bit more. I can kind of, another way to do evergreens is I sort of swish back and forth left to right like this. We'll add a little more detail on this, but I'm getting the basic green color down first. It's okay if I, I'm going over some of that green, I already, lighter green I put on there. So one thing, if the camera is focusing up close on my tip of my brush, you can see that I'm being really careful and I can get these nice little kind of lacy edges on the sides. And then as I go into the middle, I'm letting all that color flow in solidly. But on the edge, I'm sort of adding with the tip a little lacy look. So it gives you the feeling of evergreen on the edges in the distance. Another thing you can do is draw a straight line down so you know where the center of your tree is and then sort of just do a left to right movement 
This is another easy way to do it. Ooh, look at that. Just remember, it gets skinnier at the top though. You can even do like little dots just as, I mean, I don't, I love doing little textures and different kinds of strokes on my watercolor because it just makes it more interesting. When you do different strokes and, you know, you have a dark areas versus light areas, it makes your composition much more interesting. Now, right now, all of these green trees are about the same value, meaning that, yes, they're a, a pale wash of the dark green, but none are sticking out more than others. And they're all, so I'm going to go back in and darken some of these trees. But what I wanted to do was get the basic outline in of the colors first. So now, let's see, I've done almost everything. Oops, I forgot to fill in my little area here. So I'm gonna go back and pick in one of my greens over here. I don't really care which one I use. I'm gonna fill that in. I am going around my rocks right now because I wanna leave some of the white of the rocks showing through and you'll see why in a minute. Okay, so now we have basically covered our entire page and I'm going to take a minute and I'm going to dry, use a hair dryer and dry this because I want it really nice and dry right now before I start putting details and darker colors in. time because this is taking longer than I thought. <laughs> okay, I'll try to speed it up. <laughs> it is. It's now you know why they do this for art therapy, right? It's like if you're all frazzled and you go take a class, and it depends on the teacher, but if they're calm and they're like, oh, no big deal, it's really, a, it's a nice therapy, definitely. Okay, let me figure out where I'm at. And, okay, are you good? Tell me when you're ready. Okay, okay, everybody, I just, uh, dried my whole painting again. Okay. So when you want to start to get more detail in your painting, you want to make sure for the most part that things are dry. And then we're going to go back and rework on top of our base painting that we did. Okay. Now there are times when you want to work wet on wet and that's when you have already laid a wet wash in and then you go back in with a wet brush and you're dabbing some paint in there and what's going to happen it's going to spread right and it's going to get diffused on the edges and that is a beautiful look in its own right but there's other times and in um trying to think of an idea when you might use that. Maybe when you're doing some background flowers sort of out of focus, but then you want to zero in on detail. Then you want to start to have crisp edges versus edges that are softened and not as in focus. And that's how our eyes see. When we're looking at something actually, and you, the peripheral vision that we um, have in our eyes, it's not really in focus. What's in focus is the exact thing that we're looking at right in front of us and everything else is sort of blurred out of focus. And so that's why we do our paintings the same way because you want the person who is looking at this painting, you want this painting to be believable to them that they're looking into the scene so we're gonna pick even I'm gonna talk about that we're gonna pick a um, center of um, detail where we want our eyes to be focused and then everything else will be sort of soft and muted okay we're gonna pick a little area and I might do a little more sharp contrast in that area and that's where I'm training 
the viewer who's looking at my painting, that's where I want their eye to go first, okay? So in general, when you're doing um, a composition, you don't want an area of interest or detail to be around the edge because that would lead the viewer out of your painting. You want to keep them in your painting, okay? So these are just all composition, all things you learn when you're taking a class. It might be, I don't want it to be overwhelming now, so I'm going to keep it pretty simple. But I think what I'm going to do now is start on the rocks. So rocks in general, actually rocks have a lot of color in them in real life. These rocks appear to be gray, but I'm going to be adding, um, I'm going to use some paints gray, but I might pull in a little bit of uh, maybe some hmm, burnt sienna or maybe a little bit of brown in there a little bit. So I'm going to mix up my little um, puddle. This is Payne's gray. I wanted to see if I have a black so I could show you guys the difference between pure black and Payne's Gray. You may think Payne's Gray looks like black, but it's not. When you, ooh, I know what I'll do. I'll put, so I'm gonna do a little strip of Payne's Gray right here. And then I'm gonna take black watercolor. And this is why I don't like black watercolor. It's just dead, okay? Payne's Gray has more blue in it. But on its own, it can look almost like it's a, it's a kind of nondescript color, but it's still got a little blue in it, so it makes it that much more interesting. So I'm gonna work from light to dark with my rocks. In these rocks, there are some little tiny highlights in here where I'm gonna leave the white of the page coming through. And I don't wanna go right into a dark gray, so I'm bringing this paint gray over, I'm adding more water in my puddle. I'd rather go too light than too dark at first, and I can even tap my brush off a little bit with my paper towel. So I'm gonna start adding a little light. And where would your highlight be? Well, it depends on where your light source is coming from. In this painting, I, th there's no real direct light source. It looks like it might be overhead and it's sort of a diffused day. So I'm gonna pretend our light is coming from this direction onto the rocks. So then that would mean the tops of the rocks, they can stay a little bit lighter, a little bit. Maybe some of the edges have a little more. <laughs> And notice I'm not spending a lot of time trying to figure out where to put things. I'm sort of dabbing it in and I'm like, oh yeah, okay, I know it's basically at the bottom and the sides. Okay, so got that. One thing I do notice is these rocks get a little bit darker as they go back. So I can take my Payne's Gray, I'm adding a little bit more color and I'm gonna dab a little bit off on my paper towel because I don't want them too dark. But I'm gonna just take my little brush. I'm using a size six right now, just to suggest that there's some sort of rocks of some type going on back there. Now, the darker I get, it's gonna be situated more at the bottom of the rock or off to the side. So now I'm gonna put some Maybe some little shadows down here at the bottom of the rocks. So you notice as I'm starting to get more detail, I do, I do switch off to a smaller brush, okay? Because I don't want to be careless and I don't wanna get big blobs of paint. Now I'm trying to add, I'm trying to use my little brush point and add some smaller little areas. of deal. Look, I just went in there and kind of patted some dark areas in there to suggest that there's some rocks in the water, okay? And you know what, I'm, I think I'm gonna, I wanna make these rocks more interesting. So I am going to find, hmm, Van Dyke Brown, I like Van Dyke Brown. So let's see, I'll show you what the Van Dyke Brown looks like. That's kind of Van Dyke Brown, that color. So I'm gonna take a pale version of that just cause I don't want my rocks to be dull gray. I'm 
going to throw in a little brown and ooh, ooh, that adds kind of some nice contrast because there's so much green and blue and cool colors going on here. That brown adds a little warmth. Okay. All right, there is that. We will go in, we're gonna start adding some grass. We're gonna make our trees darker. And at that point, we'll be almost finished with our painting. Um, I'm gonna go back in, use my bigger brush because I don't wanna get too noodly. Actually, I might use a tin. Make, I'm gonna mix some more Viridian up. So that's the blue-green color. With the, and then I'm gonna put a little paint gray in there. And I can go in. You know what I'm gonna do too? I'm gonna leave some of this lower half a little bit lighter and suggest some tree trunks back here just for the heck of it. Ooh, I'm gonna get really dark. Ooh, these are... Okay. Remember that back and forth movement I was telling you guys about? That is such an easy way to do your little fir trees. You could do this as a holiday Christmas card. You could just do trees like this and sprinkle a little snow on it by using a paintbrush with white paint and flipping, just sort of using your thumb, drag it along and it gives you some nice snow effect on it. Okay. okay. Remember I also said you could do that nice line to, to give you a center point and how you, so, I, and as we get closer, the trees can get have be a little darker. So I'm just adding a little more pigment, a little more paint into these trees. Pretty easy going back and forth and they still look like pine trees. I think I told y'all before the the watercolor will tend to dry lighter, so you might need to go back and add a little more color once it's dry to pop in the pop up the color a little bit. You know what? There is a little lighter area of trees back here, so I'm taking this same green, but I'm adding more water to it. And these are like little trees in the background. So they're gonna appear like they're in the distance a little bit more because they're not as dark as these trees up in here. Just have more water in there, okay? Okay, now let's get our grass going. And I, I'm not putting in the flowers. You could do the flowers. Maybe I'll throw a few little purple flowers in there. But I'm going to use, there's a couple different brushes you can use. This is called a fan brush. It's pretty stiff. Um, it's not floppy. It's a stiff little brush and you, it, they call it a fan brush because it fans out. So what I want to show you guys is if I put this in, I'm going to just mix, let's just take a little permanent sap green. Let's see. Mix a little puddle. And let me see if I can do this. Yeah, see that makes nice little, you start from the bottom and you flick your wrist up and it gives you a nice little kind of grass feeling to it. Mm. And what I do is I, I kind of pick a baseline just like I did the rocks and then I flick my wrist up from that, so. Ooh, that got a little dark. I think I'll go in there and kind of pat that down a little bit. And actually, the other thing I want to tell y'all is people say, oh, I don't like watercolor because it's scary. It's so permanent. It isn't. I have never gotten myself in a situation that I couldn't get out of in watercolor. You just have to not panic and you have to 
have fun with it, um, practice. And, you know, I didn't learn this overnight. I practiced. And uh, don't be hard on yourself. You can learn it. Okay, so got some nice little areas of green. I think I'll get a little darker up front just because we said sometimes things appear a little more intense as they're up as it's up front. We can add a few little flowers in there. Maybe I'll do a little some little green coming out of here. Now, because this is so pale back here, I think I'm gonna just, normally I wouldn't just put purple over this because it picks the green up underneath, but I'm gonna go ahead and just, we're gonna pretend like there's some little purple flowers in there. You know, and let's get, how about we get a few little cadmium yellow flowers in here just to break up all this green. I'm not spending a lot of time, I'm just sort of dabbing them in sort of impressionistic. We're almost done. I'm gonna take a little more of my ultramarine blue with a little water in it. And I think I'm gonna give myself a few more ripples and uh, some nice little sort of, Those are a little too liney, so what do I do? I dip my brush in water, I pat it down, and I can sort of get rid of those lines a little bit. I like this. I think it the pop of blue going back over helps. It sort of whoops, a little dark there. What can I do? I just y'all when you're when you're trying to blot things up, don't rub. Just blot right down and come right back up. Okay? Because you don't want to smear things all over the place. Let's get a little more blue up front, just a little more intense because we said things are a little more intense up front as the person's looking at, ooh, I kind of like that. Okay, what else, what else, what else, what else? You can always add, you know, you can go back in with a little tiny, tiny brush. Like I have, this is like a size zero. You can go back in, do a few little wisps if you want of, Grass. Don't get too dark. That's a little dark. And don't, one thing I'm going to tell you guys, don't do your little grass like this. A lot of times I tell people what not to do versus don't do just like little sticks, little soldiers like that. Grass goes, it sways, it goes every which way. So you want to tilt your brush in different directions. Okay, now I think we'll make these little uh, Black Eyed Susans and then we'll be done. So I'm gonna take a little tiny Payne's Gray, not black. Put a little, I think these are dry, I don't know if they are or not. Oh, a little tiny. Should we give it a little stock? Maybe we'll give it a, a little, I guess they can't be growing in space, so I guess we can give it, put them on a little stem of some sort. Don't, just just hold your brush lightly and do everything lightly. Better than, you can always make it darker later on. I think I'm gonna. Okay, that is your basic, what I'm, oh, one thing else. I'm gonna do one more thing. I'm gonna add, you just get a little darker under these rocks, cause I just want them to pop out a little bit more. So I'm gonna take straight paints gray Now, this is the deep down dark of the shadow where the rock lays in the water. So I'm gonna pop that out a little bit and look at, I'm still using my paper towel, still blotting my brush if I think I have too much color on it.
keeping it on the ground because that's where the shadow would be. It wouldn't be going up on top of the rock because your sun's coming from this direction. So you wouldn't have any shadow on top of the rock. We'll put a little here. Let's put a little here. I'm gonna add a little down in here. Okay, so I think we're about out of time. I can go back in and add more things and pop things up if I want to, but one thing I wanna show you guys is I peel my um, tape up, and this is why a lot I do tape all the time, because it leaves a nice white edge around your picture, so you already feel like it's a professional, it makes it look that much more professional. And then I use a little fine point Sharpie and I sign my name down in the corner and you're done. And that is it. So I hope you enjoyed today's painting. And if you have any questions, feel free to get in touch with me. I have a website. Um, it's www.annbguntner.com um, and I will put it right here to see how you can see. There you go. That's it. Thanks for joining me.